Okay, so we are recording the much-anticipated Trilog conversation with Becca Tarnas and Mark Vernon. If you already follow this podcast, then you know both of these wonderful writers and thinkers and friends. Um, I've had them both on the show before. And as I was just mentioning to them before we got started in um, sort of the pre-production, this is going to be a Trilog. So we're going to be conversing with each other. Um, on the, I tentatively have titled this, and I think I just will title it, The Inklings in the Evolution of Consciousness, featuring Gene Gepser, since I've, I'm the weird outlier representing Gepser in this trialogue. Um, and we'll just see where it goes. Um, my, my introductory thought is we had planned this before COVID-19 happened, the event of events. Um, and as the months have been going by, um, Becca had reached out, uh, corresponded with Mark a little bit on Twitter, and this the, the relevancy of this time right now, right, in terms of cultural evolution, cultural crisis, and so much of what Tolkien, so much of what Barfield, so much of what Gepser talked about implicitly is sort of really prescient for right now. So it's just strange how this conversation has become even more relevant for our times and for this time. So maybe I can kind of open it up this way and just welcome you both and and let's just see where this goes. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for hosting this. And Mark, it's so wonderful to get to meet you in this space. And I'm really excited to have this dialogue. I feel like part of the impetus behind it was I always wanted to be an inkling, to have that space of dialogue at the bird and baby pub in Oxford and that kind of camaraderie of intellectual and uh, intellectual ideas blended with spirituality, religion, friendship, and so forth. And in reading both of your books, I felt myself dropped back into that kind of place and thought here in 2020, maybe we can tap into our own kind of inklings pub dialogue space and so that was where a lot of this desire was coming from for the connection and the conversation. Yeah, and thanks from me too. Um, it's very lovely to um, have a the kind of interchange in, in, in real time as, uh, as well as um, through books and, and exchanging things in that way. Um, I mean, it's interesting to be here in 2020 with all that's happening and think that um, certainly, well, and Gebser too, you know, that um, are uh, the people inspiring us and helping us to imagine into the present. Um, you know, they had their own crisis they were writing out of the first war, um, uh, which, you know, was truly devastating um, and was experienced directly, certainly by Tolkien. Um, and um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting that um, whilst the present can feel very, to me, can feel very kind of crushed. And people do talk about things speeding up and there's a sense of crisis and, and all this. I, I, one of the things which I get actually out of reading, particularly the Inklings, is a sense actually that there is some space to think, um, that there is something very present um, about this moment that absolutely gives a kind of, kind of urgency, but there's also a, a space to think um, and to imagine because, we can read them even though they were writing up to a hundred years ago. Um, and it's still uh, the present, the, the, it's still the moment now. So I like that sense of, uh, um, you know, imagination can, can, and the creativity can, can move around and can toy and, and dialogues can happen um, as well as the sort of sense of pressure. Mm -hmm. Is there something about, you know, I'm just thinking about, uh, Tolkien and Barfield and, and C.S. Lewis and even Gebser, they all had a, a creative orientation to their scholarship, right? They were all uh, fiction writers, creative writers, poets. So is, is there something about that creative element that actually, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say exactly, but kind of opens up this, this temporal space to think, to reflect, to kind of be in the middle of a crisis, but also kind of sidestep into a liminal space to reflect on that crisis through the imagination. Um, I don't know if you want, guys want to riff on that. I love that, that you're pointing us toward the importance of art and literature 
to all of these thinkers and that they, none of them were just doing purely intellectual or academic work. That's not overall what we celebrate them for. And it's that creative turn that brings in the imagination and that brings in beauty as well. Somehow I feel like finding the beauty within suffering or within crisis is actually what allows us to see more of the layers of meaning in something that can feel deeply meaningless. And if we compare this moment that we're in to other time periods of similar kind of crisis, contraction, division, difficulty, such as the First World War, such as the Second World War, it's the meaning-making capacity that beauty brings that somehow, and I'll, I'll speak for myself here, but I have a feeling I'm not alone in this. When we look back on those wars, there's something mythic about them, the way we have inherited the history of them that feels deeply meaningful, even though I certainly wouldn't want to be dropped into the trenches of World War I at all. I have gone there through my imagination and through you know, non-ordinary states of consciousness and doing the research for my dissertation, for example, to try and get a feeling of what it was like in the trenches, in the mud, and that extraordinary waste of life and lack of imagination in terms of war tactics and so on. But it's the, the turning of that into art and beauty that we see in so many diverse forms from Tolkien to Hemingway that you know they're not really comparable in terms of their artistic co content and yet there's a transformative process that's taking place within the realm of the imagination to make sense of an experience like that and the moment that we're in now does I think offer that kind of opportunity to in the present moment make that kind of deep meaning and there's a jeremy you brought up a kind of slow uh, speeding up of time but and yet there's also this slowing down i've been thinking a lot about the nature of time in these last couple of months and i want to put this question to both of you of what your experience of time has been. And I know that this is very relevant to particularly Gebser, but I feel the way I've been holding both of uh, your books in my mind is, Mark, your book seems to be this orientation toward the past coming in to the present. And Jeremy, yours, while it does certainly turn toward the past with the stages of consciousness, I was so much more aware of the orientation toward the future and how reading them kind of simultaneously, they really inform each other well. I was so grateful that Happenstance made it that I was able to read these two books in tandem and kind of overlapping. And so this does bring up for me the question of time. And while time has felt like it's accelerating, it's more linear and rushing forward, in these last two months in particular, and I'm speaking, of course, as someone who isn't working in healthcare, who isn't at home with a young child, whose life has probably become more cramped and sped up. I'm one of those privileged people who is getting to slow down to a certain degree, but time has started to feel more circular or more spiralic, this turn from more goal-oriented or project-oriented progress to coming back in on itself in terms of practice. And I'm curious both at personal levels with both of you, how that has looked and how it relates to these thinkers that you are each representing here and their relationship to time. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah, it's really, really fascinating. And um, the, a first place your 
response there takes me to is thinking about the links between beauty and beauty as a kind of felt quality of experience. Um, so for example, um, watching the news as you do, um, you know, it's part of the kind of ritual of engaging with um, these major events like the COVID um, outbreak. Um, if you ask, I, I sort of ask myself, what quality of time is being, as it were, broadcast towards me when I'm watching a news story? And even in the course of, say, an hour news, news programme, the quality of time will shift really quite a lot from the kind of the, the pressing moment of the day about personal protective equipment. Um, though these kind of concerns have been huge in the UK. But then you have a different quality will come through when, for example, there was a story that became huge here when a 99 year old um, retired soldier um, walked with his Zimmer frame to raise money for the National Health Service. And that was a very, very different quality of time. There was something timeless about him, partly because he was 99 years old. He knew the First World War, in fact, um, and, but it was beautiful too. Um, you know, he was called a hero and so on, but you, it allowed you to, to feel the same moment, but with a very, very different quality. And I think that the, it's linked to creativity as well that um, our people give us, um, that because they were alert to beauty, that leads them to a different kind of quality of the present moment, a different quality of time that allows them to be creative. Um, you might even say that, you know, this chap, with his Zimmer frame, he was being kind of creative in the moment. Um, uh, and they took their creativity towards artistic literary pursuits. Um, but there's something there, I, as you're speaking there, that these three things feel like they can come together even in the present moment. Um, that if you're alert to the quality of time, perhaps that you feel yourself even moving from moment to moment um, and use criteria like beauty to get a feel for that then that makes for creative and imaginative possibilities, which, you know, our people were all completely clear that imagination is the future coming towards us. And it's not just imagination as in how our perceptions are coloured, but imagination as in our um, creative engagement with that as well, that it becomes, you know, a, a reflexive process, co-workers and so on. Um, which is absolutely central to Barfield, Tolkien, and Gebser. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, you know, I've I've been thinking about this in a similar way uh, to both of you, in the sense that um, I I too am one of those privileged people who don't have to go deliver food or um, need to do essential work, um, and so most of my time has been at home, um, and. It's oscillated actually, and I've been noticing this kind of um, flux of different experiences of time. There'll be weeks where the week will just go by. It'll just speed through and the days will blur. And then there are other times where the afternoon will stretch out and feel like uh, many days, just in terms of reading quietly, um, hearing people, uh, I live in an apartment, so uh, a lot of people are still having conversations with each other outside at night. No one's going anywhere. And so there's this kind of releasing of the pace of modern life at the same time it also is speeding up in this crisis. Um, and this kind of just flux of these different experiences of stretching and condensing time. But uh, one of the things that, that's come up for me in the context of uh, teaching the Gebser class right now uh, Gebser said, uh, you know, what happens today, so much of what happens today happens of itself. And it, it got me thinking just about how, um, you know, this crisis and how it kind of occurred as an event, right? This is not something that we engineered, despite what conspiracy theorists are talking about, right? It, this, is, this is a kind of planetary event, and it happens of itself. But how interesting it is it that sometimes even the crisis can be kind of have a, a dynamic intelligence or response to what is needed, right? So what is happening to so many of us in our homes? We're, we're slowing down, we're watching flowers bloom out the window, we are taking time for introspection, perhaps, you know, too much introspection now, we're kind of locked in our boxes alone. But in a way, it's almost it's almost a kind of like, like Pope Francis is saying, a, like a response to the to the 
um, industrious rushing forward of our civilization, we've been kind of halted. And on a personal level, we've suddenly been invited to take time for introspection, for experiencing time differently. And so I've been wondering, is there just entertaining this thought that, you know, this has been obviously a crisis, but on the other hand, it's been a remediating crisis in that it's remediating a different sense of time that as moderns, we have been trying to escape from, right? We, we, we have no time, you know, the, the modern pace of life is at such a rush right now, especially in the gig economy, um, that, you know, we're suddenly not out of a conscious, like enlightened desire to reintegrate, you know, introspection and reflection of the soul, like what Gebser says, the mythical consciousness, but the event has sort of created the conditions to remediate this, this kind of structure of time. Um, and then I also thought of like this idea, right? Like that people are talking about this possibility that the, 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 the curve will hit multiple times. Like we'll go out in the summertime and then in the winter, it'll, the cases will start to rack up again and then we'll all have to quarantine again. And there are many reports and, and doctors saying that this may be the new normal for a few years. And I'm just thinking of like, well, how I, I went to Gepser and, and this, this theme of the mythical structure of time, which is rhythmic, right? Or spiral like that you were saying, Becca, and that it, there's almost some, um, as he says, myth is like the opening and closing of the wound. And there's this opening and closing of, of, you know, the modern lifestyle. We're going in, we're pausing, then we're being released to go to the, the rush of modern life again, and then we're pausing again. So there's this weird in and out breath we're being remediated into, just out of the crisis happening as it does of itself. And I just find that to be so interesting and so, inf um, not informative exactly, but um, yeah, just this spontaneously remediating a sense of time that we have not really um, been comfortable with as moderns. So. That's where my thought goes uh, with that question. Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, uh, to pick up a response to that, um, one of the things which uh, I get from psychotherapy work, actually, um, is that um, a real moment of possibility comes when the individual is able not just to be in a kind of dyadic relationship with their, their trouble, um, whatever it might be, um, but it's the very attention to their trouble that enables them to kind of take a step back from it as well. And I just wonder whether, you know, if, Jeremy, we do end up living with this for quite some time. Um, there will initially be a phase where, you know, we feel in one zone one minute and one zone the next. But then both zones might become relativized and it becomes possible to, for a new attitude towards life to emerge, a kind of third position it's often talked about in psychotherapy. Um, and that in a way, I think for me, would be the truly creative moment because it wouldn't just be about, as it were, being locked into one um, state of consciousness, um, you know, uh, seeing it come and seeing it go. Um, but the very awareness of that rhythm can enable um, space to emerge around it um, and then we become in the position where we might actually realize that um, that both of the more immediate states that we find ourselves in, for want of a better expression, um, are relativized um, and new possibilities for life might start to really emerge at that point. This idea of rhythm, that rhythmical relationship to time and how that can shift consciousness is it's absolutely fascinating to think about. And that, let's say that scenario is true, where there is this kind of perhaps yearly in-breath and out-breath. We have lived in a culture, cultures that are so oriented toward really ignoring the rhythms of nature, ignoring the yearly rhythm of the seasons. You know, we eat food from all over the world that is completely disconnected from the growing season and there's little awareness that you know tomatoes only thrive in the heat of summer for example we can get kind of sad pink tomatoes anytime and that disconnection you know the fact that there are almost no seeds available in stores and very little flower that turning toward 
growing one's own food, baking one's own bread is in itself a reconnection to our embodied experience of nutrition, of our interconnection with the earth and the fact that that is what nourishes us and it can only nourish us in season, which is a, a rhythmical time. And if that is indeed the case, that there is this, what I'm sure will, it, it certainly already is, is feeling like a constriction on our freedom. We have to be physically distanced from each other. But if there is a coming out and then going back in and Mark, as you're bringing up, can that at some point become a creative turn? And I've been thinking about this in the context of, you know, when we hear these stories where turtles, for example, are able to hatch on now empty beaches or beaches that are empty of human activity. And thinking of at this crucial moment, spring in the Northern hemisphere, that so much life is getting to regenerate. What if a human ecological civilization, and I'm speaking from my most idealistic self here, but what if a human ecological civilization could look like embracing that inner and outer movement where there is that time that in part in response to the prevalence of a disease, a pandemic, but also in response to the natural rhythms of the ecosystems we're all embedded in, that we consciously make the choice to step back for a certain time each year and allow those other species to flourish. And what over you know, the course of a decade would that look like in terms of the regeneration of ecosystems and the rehabilitation of habitats and the strengthening of other species besides our own. Because the reality that we're seeing is that our successful growth as a species is what is undermining our ability to survive as a species. And there's no reason that a pandemic should be showing us all the things that it is, but it's pointing out all the weaknesses in our systems. And I feel like it's pointing toward those solutions. And what's extraordinary is that we do seem to be at this kind of crossroads where there are so many different directions we could go in. And the reality is we're probably going to go in all of them as um, you know, realities are splintering right now. Nobody can agree on what's true and, um, what is real news and fake news and so on. There are multiple worlds on this one teeming planet. So I really like that idea that you're both bringing forward of this creative embrace, almost an artistic embrace of life as a rhythm rather than this propelling forward that has so defined, I guess, to use Gebser's language, the the theoretical or the mental uh, stage of consciousness. Yeah, and it's not that like you know there there's no room in nature for uh, a a directionality, right? Like plants do that; they shoot up to the sun. It's just it, it has it's it's part of a larger dynamic and process it's also growing down right it's growing up it's growing down it's growing horizontally rhizomatically so you know i think that this idea that mark brought up too that this is um a creative turn that that transforms something that exp is experienced as entrapment into well okay if we are living year to year in this in and out breath um culture changes, right? Our consciousness of time will change and adapt to that and perhaps expand or intensify. And that to me, as again, as, as difficult as this is um, for so many, you know, it's, it's also kind of pointing to, like you're saying, Becca, like just, just giving the world um, a, a space and a time to breathe and regenerate. And it's also giving us, right? Like, to one-sidedly emphasize directionality and progress and linear time and exponential growth, not only of capital, but of our lives, right? Like our careers, the pace of life, um, living as in, in the modern uh, economy. Um, 
it's giving us a chance to remediate our own souls, right? To remediate with the earth, to the planet, to natural cycles and seasons. So, you know, I think there's, and, and I like, I like this turn. This is something I bring up a lot with like um, the Bruno Latour's uh, work. And he has this book called down to earth. And um, I like that turn of phrase because this crisis and the responses to it, even if this is just a sort of temporary autonomous zone where, where a potential beautiful future kind of just latently blossoms a little bit, uh, it, it's revealing to us that sense of the future in a very concrete, realized, living sense. Like, oh, remediation is what is needed and it's happening, right? Um, people are, as you said, um, Becca, people are trying to figure out how to, well, maybe I should grow my own food, right? Maybe I should get involved in some kind of um, community uh, garden commons where we'll have some local vegetables. Maybe we should start thinking about uh, localizing supply chains and restructuring the economy towards, you know, helping everyday people. Like, I know this is not, we're not moving into a utopia, but everyone is kind of being forced to consider it in a very real subsistence oriented uh, level of questioning. So I just find it so interesting. Like when we talk about the emergence of the future, it's that, that turn of phrase, everything that is happening today occurs of itself. It, it makes me kind of go like, well, in order to really listen to the future, we really have to come down to earth and, and hear what is happening right in the world. Like what is arising out of this crisis? And, um, if we can listen to it, you know, we can alleviate the suffering of not only our generation, but of future generations. Like if we really tune in to what is being asked for and called for. Um, so one of the things I wanted to just mention this because um, it was in my uh, recent class, um, uh, William Blake poem, where he's talking about the sense of the future. Um, and there's just a few lines from it that I think are so relevant to this conversation. And it, it, I got it, actually, I discovered it through a Le Guin essay, Ursula K. Le Guin essay, where she's talking about utopia and progress and modernity. And here's William Blake casting away futurism, right? Modernity in terms of the sense of marching forward and embracing the future in the present. And uh, it goes like this. He says, then go, O dark futurity, I will cast thee forth from these heavens of my brain, nor will I look upon futurity no more. I cast futurity away and turn my back upon that void, which I have made for lo, futurity is in this moment. So I, I just love that emphasis. Like if we're going to talk about a new world and a new culture, so much of this crisis, right? And so much of, of um, the immediacies and material realities of how we're having to turn about to face the ecological crisis that this is a part of is about coming into the present, right? Uh, which again is this very Gibsonian theme, but uh, I won't hog the mic. <laughs> no, I, I, mean, I love you mentioning William Blake because I live in South London um, and William Blake saw angels on Peckham Rye just down the road from where I live. And I often think if William Blake could see angels on Peckham Rye, then there's hope. Um, if you've ever been to he Peckham Rye, it's not the most natural place you'd think of seeing angels. Um, but I, yeah, but, but um, Blake's the, the other word that, that, uh, that come, that's coming to my mind as you're, as you're speaking there um, is um, the, you know, what uh, in the romantic tradition is called polarities and Blake called contraries. Um, Jung, um, thinking of Becker's earlier work called The Transcendent Function. And I think that there's something about holding the tension that makes for a radically new possibility again. And the practical outcomes of a radically new possibility might be um, well, I'm sure there would be completely different systems economically providing food and so on. But my sense is that we've really got to hold out for the radically new vision for those things to um, not just be sustainable, but to be really wanted um, because there's a vision that makes them truly desirable. So we move on from the, um, the, 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 the sort of present consciousness with its awareness of what needing to fix things to a new consciousness where things um, become a bit more self-organizing because they're truly desired. And, and, and as you were speaking, um, I was thinking about my experience of um, the present moment, which includes actually, I'm pretty sure, having had the virus. Um, I wasn't, it was only mildly, so I wasn't tested, but there's a lot of people around here have had it. And um, 
you know, for various reasons, feel fairly sure I did. And whilst it was mild, it did bring out another side of the natural world, which was this very strange experience that a virus that mutated on the other side of the world just two or three months before had got it in, itself into my body. And, and whilst I didn't um, ever feel, you know, particularly a threat from that, uh, my partner, for example, is in one of the higher risk groups. And so it felt like whilst we didn't remotely have uh, a, an encounter with death in the way that some people very much are, um, that side of nature, you know, sort of walked past our front door still. Um, and I think that there's something about holding on to the experience both of um, death in nature and the new life that with the quietness um, we're experiencing as well. I mean, in our, we've got only a small garden in the middle of South London, and yet we've got a flock of goldfinches in our garden now. And they are like angels flitting by with their red and gold. So it's, it's the polarity, I think, um, of, um, of death and life. And what that does to me in my better moments um, is make me realize that uh, they have an asymmetric relationship and that um, holding the polarity together enables me to, at least at times, fall onto a deeper sense of life, um, which is to be connected with a spiritual ecology, you might say. And I know that both you have written about this as well, um, where we experience nature um, not just in um, the uh, material and the biological sense, beautiful as that can be, as well as frightening. Um, but we realize that, um, well, to use Blake's idea, um, that, you know, when we look at the sun, um, we see more of the sun when we see the Holy of Holies, um, uh, not just, as it were, the Guinea sun looking like a gold disc in the sky. And I feel that if we can hold on to those polarities in the present moment, it might expand our vision. So we start seeing um, the spiritual sun. We start recovering for the new consciousness, what was so evident, say, in the mythical consciousness of uh, spiritual ecology, intelligences, powers and principalities, all that side of things, um, if we can bear the tension, which is a big ask, because it's not easy. It's so interesting that we're speaking about time and the relationship to death and how these are qualities, uh, kind of archetypal qualities of a, a Sunex or Saturnian kind of figure that you know, time mythically eats his own children. And that's the, it's the process of time moving forward. And that that prospect becomes more and more frightening as we move away from a cyclical understanding or spiralic sense of time, not having a you know, reincarnational perspective on life cycles or not having a sense of rejoining the ancestors. If we look at the earlier phases of consciousness that you both write about. And this question is particularly directed to Mark, but both of you that, you know, there's the, the theme of time in, in both of your works and especially in uh, Jeremy, your work writing about Gebser. Mark, you're writing about the in process of interiorization and the forging of individuality and how it is that forging of individuality that makes more apparent death as a frightening prospect rather than something that is part of the, the natural cycles that are certain and inherent. And so just to open that question to you around what your work on tracing that process of interiorization, particularly through a Barfieldian lens, but of course your own as well, and, and that Christian perspective on that too. I'm not, I don't want to formulate too specific a question because I, I just want to leave that field open to hear, hear your thoughts on that and how it's relevant to this moment. Do we find ourselves in such a turn as, as both of you have so uh, carefully documented in each of your works. Yeah, well, I, I just uh, um, an initial response and then maybe you can, Jeremy, you can develop things as well. Um, the, an expression of Barfield, which I 
really like is that um, our task is not just to discover our own interiority, which deepens through the sense of alienation um, from the cycles you're talking about there, Becca, as much as anything else, because in a way we're thrown onto ourselves often in the struggle. Um, but as you know, that is always the potential um, for uh, an expansion of ourselves as well. But it's not just our own interiority, but as Balfour put it, the inside of the whole world um, that can become available to us again. Um, and I think that's because um, our sense of participation in life, um, we realise, um, is um, one of being held within life itself. Um, this is certainly how I would experience it. Um, and that um, I realise that... Um, the there's a reciprocity, um, it, it would be another good Barfieldian word there, um, between my experience of life and the life of the world around me. Um, so um, through, very practically, you know, through uh, maybe the desire to use ritual and invocation, um, as well as more familiar meditative practices, for example, um, to open up onto the sense of that wider life once more. Um, becoming alert to the stranger things and taking them seriously, um, such as synchronicities, um, which you, you know you get as well in therapy when a certain stage of psychotherapy is reached, often people start to notice these things. Um, and it's the sense that the life that is moving around you becomes less frightening um, and becomes something to befriend and something to uh, co cooperate with and co-create with. Um, that might that these are these are just intimations for me, but I try and follow the intimations to use the the lovely Blake expression you know he's these are the golden threads that we might follow um, that leads us into um, Jerusalem's gate built in Jerusalem's wall and so on yeah but Jeremy I mean, what about uh, Gebser because he um, developed these thoughts very particularly too yeah I think um <clears throat> you know one of the one of the things that i've been sort of meditating on is this sense that um uh the the nature of this this linear sense of time right like the development of the self the emergence of reflexivity that the soul taught us right narcissist staring in the pool the mirror of reflection of the interior waters this kind of sense of self-reflection which helps allow the ego to emerge in, in the history of consciousness like um one of the things he, he points out with the myth of uh, Athena and Zeus, right, is that um, he kind of takes that myth, that event, to be this kind of mythological um, earthquake, right? It, it shakes heaven and earth. When Athena is born from the head of Zeus, it rips open this sort of mythical consciousness. And Athena, of course, you know, um, the the see sort of the archetype of Athens and philosophy and she's she comes out of Zeus's head with a spear in her hand and she's going forward right she's both the kind of the the patroness of of um law and and philosophy and thinking in war right so it's a very kind of this emergence of the mental and she sort of invokes that in this wonderful myth but um Part of this, as Gebser points out, it's a wound, right? Like the burden of having an ego and having this self-consciousness and being able to sort of identity, identify thought with being an ego is that you die, right? There's this sort of uh, the marching forward of time without what Becca was saying, that without that sense of renewal, it's pretty scary, right? Because you've got kind of this perspectival horizon and at the end of that event horizon, you don't know what's next. If you're cut off from the ancestors, if you're cut off from uh, these mythical cycles and participating in them in a meaningful mode of perception, then you're just you, the waking ego you. And that's terrifying, right? And so we kind of defend that. And, and so many of the myths kind of have this, um, especially of kings like Gilgamesh and Enkidu, have this kind of, uh, melancholy about the burden of being awake to ourselves and knowing that there's a finality to that. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just think there's something very interesting in that duality, right? This elation of, of, of the ego and the will, and then also this kind of sense of um, 
uh, the, the mortality and the limits of that. Like that is that mode of consciousness is not able to um, overcome the problem of death and Kronos um, and Saturn eventually, you know, Saturn has the uh, Kronos, right? Has the sickle, right? Isn't that mm-hmm. sort of the old image, right? The mm-hmm. cutting and the cutting of course is related to the thinking. So if, in thinking and in the mental consciousness, there's always this ambiguity between dividing and individuality And then also ultimately like the dividing deed leads to death. So how do we reconcile that? Right. And, and I think in some ways like our culture is dealing with that right now, not just with this pandemic, but also this larger question of, of our civilization is, is it going through a death Our species, right? As some people are suggesting some scientists, is this not only a, a cultural death, but a, you know, a a literal death of our species like Jem Bendel is, is, not strongly positing, but he's suggesting it as a possibility. So we're really dealing with the most profound existential questions about us being here, right, on Earth. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know where I'm going with this exactly, except to just sort of entertain some of these thoughts about ego and time and mortality and the individuation of the self. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in with a thought. This is a kind of half formed thought that w- is emerging in response to that myth of Athena, where you do have the emergence of this intellectual warrior goddess of wisdom, and, and yet she's a goddess. And I've always found Athena to be something of uh, an enigma or just this extraordinary figure, a a female deity born from her father's head. And in some ways that feels like an expression of the the solar woman, for example, who has figured out how to survive under patriarchy. Look at Athens. They have the ancient Athens has the patron deity is a female goddess but it's also an extremely patriarchal society that doesn't even count women as citizens. And the connection, this half-formed connection that I'm drawing is actually between that image, that mythic image of Athena, who is very clear that her role isn't one of having children, of being part of that kind of cyclical, maternal expression of the feminine. And the connection I'm drawing is to many, many centuries later with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, and how she's demonstrating that to try and create life without the principle of the mother, it's the the scientific, rational ego of Dr. Frankenstein, who says, I'm going to create a human life without that maternal container. And that there is something very incomplete about that picture. And Mary Shelley's story feels like an apt myth for the time that is dying now a recognition that we cannot move forward without holding both necessary parts of that life-giving faculty uh, of, in that biological sense, the male and the female. In a more archetypal sense, though, I feel like it's important to move away just from that gendered binary because there is something profound in the model of Athena for women today. And there's something profound in the image of a nurturing lunar maternal father. And that both are very much needed to find that that transcendent piece, that third that breaks beyond the polarity. 
anyway, I'm kind of thinking through that in the moment as I'm speaking, but those are some of the, the myths and images and stories that came to mind, Jeremy, as you were speaking. Mm. Yeah, I very much like um, this use of the past um, to, in the first moment, to challenge the present because you realize that people could live in very different ways in the past. Um, and then that difference, which becomes a polarity and um, becoming a, a, a springboard to reimagine the future. Um, uh, actually, there's a really interesting book I was just reading, just um, uh, um, called, I can look it up, um, The Realness of Things um, by a scholar called Anderson. Um, and it's about how actually um, the ancient Greek world might have been a lot stranger than we tend to assume um, because there is a kind of popular way of, or well, it's quite an academic way actually, of in, engaging with the past that sees it as um, the, origin, the originator of our own sensibilities around, say, democracy, around, say, philosophy, around, say, the economy, um, science. But actually, um, if we can revisit it and to use Barfield's expression, unthink what we know before we go back and encounter it afresh, um, it can become uh, a, um, just dislocate us rather than affirm us in what we think we know. And that can be very beneficial. So for example, he talks about how um, in ancient Athens, um, and it, it reminded me, I was reminded of this back because it reminded me about um, when you're talking about Athena and how absolutely vital it was for in Athenian society to know of connection with the land um, and um, which was conceptualized um, with female imagery very, very often. Um, but that, what that did was it meant that um, you might say the more um, male desire to control things, um, which particularly say gets manifest these days in the economy, um, didn't really exist back then. Um, and the, a huge part of people's activity was um, devoted to relating to um, Athena for sure, but also for um, the land, nature, the place around and about. Um, and um, I found that very helpful really, because it made me think, um, you know, a, a society which was immensely creative in many ways was also um, very brutal in other ways. Um, uh, needn't be sort of a bit like ours. It could actually be really rather different, even if we think it was quite like ours. Um, and um, that I think is very helpful for now. Um, maybe because it makes us realize we can give up um, a certain amount um, and something new might emerge. Um, I also, again, particularly like it because I think what they did know very directly, which I think we struggle to know directly now, is um, that our life is part of a deeper, wider flow of life, and that relating to that deeper, wider flow of life can be a very um, productive way of organizing um, individually and socially as well. Mark, I'm thinking of how you articulate so well in your book and, and bring forward Barfield's way of thinking that makes really clear how often we project our current state of consciousness onto the past, whether that's Barfield pointing out that our conception of prehistory or of the earth before there was human life or maybe even life at all, that there isn't a modern human observer back then taking notes on what it looked like. And that participatory relationship to constructing our understanding of history is very applicable to, well, to any area, but as we're speaking of right now in terms of, uh, of ancient Athens, for example. And that there's something so relieving in holding that perspective of an evolution of consciousness that both Gebser and Barfield and you know numerous others who inspired them and were contemporary with them um, that 
the relief comes in recognizing that we're not at the end of that process and that we are participating in that next turn of consciousness however long it takes. The discouraging part in reading both of your works is how long it takes uh, when we look at the, the amount of time, for example, that the spread of Christianity took and compare what individuals said in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth centuries and realizing, okay, each of these stages took a really long time and, and our lifetimes are just not that long. I've been trying to hold that in the context right now of recognizing we're still in the middle of a story. And to bring Tolkien in here, there's a pivotal moment that I know Jeremy's heard me talk about this moment a lot. There's this pivotal moment when Frodo and Sam are on the edge of Mordor, which is pretty much the it's not quite the most challenging and difficult moment in their story that still lies unfortunately ahead, but they know it's coming. There's that sense of anticipation. And I feel like we're in that kind of moment right now where you know it's going to get worse. And it's already, you're already on the borders of Mordor. And the exchange that these two little hobbits have is comparing that moment in their lives to pivotal turns in the stories they grew up being told and realizing that there was no way that those figures knew the outcome of their story, that those moments of disconnection, of feeling utterly lost, you know, applying this to the Christian story of Christ's moment on the cross of being disconnected completely from God and feeling utterly abandoned, that that is absolutely essential to how the story unfolds. And it's that recognition that Frodo and Sam come to on in the mountains, on the borders of Mordor, where they realize, oh, we're in a story. And that story is going to be told by someone else, maybe even by us to begin with, but it's going to be retold and we'll know the ending is there and then it will make sense. And I feel like our current moment now is very much one of those places where we do realize we're in the middle of the story and we don't know if this is going to be a tragedy or a comedy, a romance, you know, the difference between a, a tragedy and, and a comedy is that the comedy gets one extra act to work things out. And some of us may see that last act, some may not. And the recognition too, that there is no final ending in that ongoing story, even if there is a final ending of the human story the place that I feel like each of us maybe in somewhat different ways, but that we're coming from is that that story of consciousness keeps going, even if the human story comes to a close in the forms that have been familiar to us in our lifetimes and even throughout the centuries and millennia. That's such a, a fantastic moment. And uh, I, I love the way that you, there and, and elsewhere, Becca. Um, I think I think remake the myth of poetic for us now because what it feels to me like that does when you talk about Frodo and Sam on the edge of Mordor is um, it, it, it means that the the myth of poetic, the stories that have been told, um, makes time diaphanous as well as space, um, which perhaps was how myth was originally used. Well, maybe not. Anyway, but it makes time diaphanous. And, um, and that is to know that your present moment is the past and the future too, you know, so that sense of um, the, it is in a way that um, the smallness of life that actually enables it to open on to um, the sort of timeless sense of life as well, um, which the mythopoetic vision remade for now, I think, can, can give us. Beautifully said, both of you. 
Um, I'm actually reminded of uh, a line from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, I believe it is Aragorn who says this, um, but I had it up uh, to share during our podcast today. But uh, they say, yet it is not our part to master all the tides of the world, but to do what it is, what is in us for the succor of those wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. What weather they shall have is not ours to rule. And I just love that because it was this question of like, you know, what what other evil things are going to show up and like, how can we stop it? And it's like, it's not about that. It's about what we do here. But there's this sense that this moment is like the moments of the past, but is also like this, um, a deep intimacy with the future, like to leave clean earth to till. It's just such a beautiful image. Um, and struck such a chord with what so many of us are, are thinking today in terms of the climate crisis and what are we leaving future generations. But um, I love this idea that you mentioned, Mark, that time becomes diaphanous when we realize that we are in a story and that, as Becca, you were saying, this is a moment like so many other moments in the history of consciousness where we are going through a very dramatic and radical restructuring Um, where there's breakdown and creativity, dissolution and solution happening simultaneously. But this is not the only time, right? And I think this is sort of, this is sort of how Gebser opens up uh, ever-present origin, you know, where he says, you know, only somebody who is in a state of transition is bemoaning the end of their, of their culture and they only see the end, but really it's just a transition. So if we can, not only in these stories, but also, you know, I think for us as, as scholars of, of consciousness evolution and, and culture, to have this sense of diaphanous time, that our moment is a transitional one like previous ones, it frees us up, I think, to some capacity to hold it in a, in a greater scope, right? To not feel so um, fragmented or, or cut off or to feel so narrowly that this is an end and it might be an end for our species maybe but just to know this has happened before right just to know that we're part of this process can be at least free up some of that creative energy right free up not if not a um a naive optimism then a sense of participation at the very least right in this larger process and i think that that's so helpful right now yeah maybe just to add one quick thought onto that which i think Tolkien, Barfield and Gebser can really bring actually to this wider conversation about the evolution of consciousness, which is that their conceptions I don't think were linear, they weren't developmental, um, they, and they weren't actually even cyclical I don't think, they weren't, um, well Barfield's favourite shape anyway was, it was the U, um, it's the kind of return with difference, um, and, and I think I, I feel that's freeing as well, um, because it, it, it means that it says, you know, it really does say the most important moment is the present moment. It's not anticipating the linear progression. It all happens in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and to to just uh, dovetail into that, there's this sense with Gebser too, right? And I've noticed this with Tolkien and Gebser as well, but speaking of the U curve, like uh, Barfield talks about original participation and final participation. Gebser talks about origin an originary consciousness and what he calls the integral consciousness is really kind of bringing forward everything, all of the different modes and expressions of the human being that have um, um, flared forth in history, right? Magical, mythical time, rhythmic time, modernity and linear time, all of it are these sort of creative capacities of consciousness. And what the integral is really doing is sort of bringing everything into this diaphanous present where that's all here rendered conscious in this originary spiritual presence. Um, And there is a sense of kind of retrieving what has been lost, but it's not just to going back, as you're saying. And just to kind of, again, add this element, what he talks about with each of these dramatic restructurings of consciousness, there's, there's a gain and a loss, right? If we, if we lose the mythical sense of time and rhythmic time, we might gain this new sense of the, um, egoic consciousness and using I in our language and reflexivity and then all of the wonders and marvels and terrors of modern civilization. So we gain so much, but we also lose so much. And it's, it's never a sense of like forward, progressive, unilateral progress, right? 
Um, so I think that's that's very helpful. And I got that sense from Tolkien as well, Becca. Maybe this is sort of a question or theme we can explore with um, to really dive into the inklings and the evolution of consciousness, right? Is this theme that seems to be in Tolkien's work where uh, in The Lord of the Rings, we get the sense that the world of Middle Earth is going through this evolution of consciousness, that the world itself changes, right? With the, the sinking of Numenor. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that or, or riff on that. Absolutely. It's, I've been trying to think both leading up to this conversation and especially as, as we've all been talking about how what Tolkien wrote do, does and does not fit into the kind of schema that Gebser and, and Barfield in their own ways are speaking about and, and articulating. And for Tolkien, I feel like we're seeing part of the process where what he is bringing forward through story is certainly an evolution of of consciousness and a a shift through different ages he brings forward he begins with the creation of the world which is extraordinary how that is sung into being and all of the stages in that creation process and then there are the three ages of the world that are in time. And the first age is by far the most mythic. And this is the time period that he spent the most amount of his own life writing, decades writing the stories of the first age, these elvish myths and the interactions between the powers of the world and these uh, elven kingdoms and the creation of the stars and the story behind the emergence of the sun and the moon. And there, there's all, they're all related to light. And this is something, there's a wonderful book by my favorite Tolkien scholar, Verlin Flieger, this book called Splintered Light, where she brings Owen Barfield's perspective to bear on Tolkien's Silmarillion. It's an extraordinary work and one I highly recommend, where she looks at that, the way Tolkien through story basically illustrated a lot of Barfield's philosophical concepts. And so they, they pair very beautifully. I've, it's interesting that, that Barfield couldn't actually bring himself to finish reading The Lord of the Rings because I don't, it didn't grab him. It, he wasn't, he, it didn't click in some way. And I think that probably Tolkien didn't really take in everything that Barfield was bringing forward either. But I know that his book, Poetic Diction, had a tremendous effect on Tolkien and set in motion a thought process around the evolution of language and the, how it captures an evolution of consciousness within it and how he not just consciously tried to articulate that in his stories. I think actually what's more important is his recognition of how he'd already been doing that in his stories, which in itself is a more profound backing of what Barfield was saying than if he was consciously putting it into story. But the, the fall of Numenor, the drowning of this island civilization that is comparable to Atlantis, Tolkien was compelled to write this because he was haunted by a dream of the drowning of Numenor. He called it his Atlantis complex. And he had this dream over and over again from childhood. So there's something breaking through his own consciousness here that he's needing to articulate in story. And he saw this as the intersection of myth with history. The moment that Numenor drowns is when the world is broken, the mythic world is broken and we enter into the world of history. And he did embed that story within his mythology significantly near the end of the second age, right? So it's a turning point that it happens to be in that middle age toward the end of it, that mythic time comes to an end and historical time begins. And, but he tried to write that in a number of other places too, the Lost Road, the Notion Club papers, 
trying to fit it actually into this world because those stories start off with a character a whole lot like him or with a group of people a whole lot like the Inklings, but break through into this mythic drowning of Numenor. The Lord of the Rings is set, and The Hobbit, they're set at the end of the Third Age. And that is the story that most people are most familiar with, where he had wanted, Tolkien had wanted to give a myth of the first and second ages, but he found actually that really what he was doing was telling the story of the fall and passing away of this world that was so beloved to him. And really demonstrating that this is the, this is the ending of a kind of consciousness. He is setting up in his story, the world that we live in now. He is giving us a mythic tale of how disenchantment and as he describes it, the rule of men, how that comes in. And so at the end of The Lord of the Rings, yes, Middle Earth has been saved by the destruction of the ring, but the cost, I mean, this is the shift that Gebser's describing from the mythic to the mental. The cost is the loss of the elves. It's the loss of magic and enchantment in that world. And it gives way to the disenchanted, all too human world that we find ourselves in now. He said somewhere that, you know, perhaps we're in the, the sixth or seventh age now. And so we could leave it at that. We could leave it at Tolkien just articulated that first part of the process. But if we take a step back and realize that Tolkien was an individual in the 20th century who was writing this story because it was coming through him. Not because he sat down and said, I'm going to write a myth, but because these powerful images, these dreams, perhaps even visionary experiences were coming through him, but in an interior way. And I'm thinking, Mark, of your description of that increasing process of interiorization, where the mythic becomes so inward that the only way to discover it is that it's encapsulated within a, a private fantasy story. Now we all have the opportunity in reading it to enter into that and realize that we too have that within us. So at that level, I see that turn almost as one is re-engaging the mythic, re-engaging the divine through our our interiorization, but it's now, it's a separated world. And that, again, we find ourselves in that moment where we ask, what comes next? You go, to, to use Jung's perspective, you go so far in that you find yourself outward again in another world, or Henri Corbin's perspective, that to go so far inward, the, there's an inversion, a topographical inversion that takes place and we find ourselves in the imaginal realm, in, in a, a world of um, myths and images once more, but we no longer have the confusion of, is it on the outside world? And so the question that I hold around this, and again, with our current moment is, what's the importance of the separation? Importance of the separation. Can it be bridged? Should it be bridged? Will that separation break down at some point? These are questions I don't have answers to, of course, but I'm so curious about and would love to hear your thoughts on them. Yeah, I mean, just picking up from where you ended up there, the Tolkien expression, you catastrophe comes up. Um, and I think at the moment I'm actually um, doing a deep dive into Dante um, because it's the 700th anniversary of the Divine Comedy this year and then next year is the 700th, 700th anniversary of Dante's death. Hmm. And, um, you know, it's very striking that right at the bottom of hell, the way out is on Lucifer's body. Um, you know, it's not suddenly an angel comes and whisks them away. You keep going. Um, into the tragedy. Um, now in the theistic context, because you have intimations and maybe even know that um, it is a comedy, 
um, that the way down is actually also the ascent and um, that the two with the shift of consciousness um, can be seen as uh, you know part and parcel of the same thing. Um, I guess that that's something that both Barfield and Tolkien did share in their different way and um, that they did broadly trust um, the Christian perception of things. Um, uh, yeah, it's interesting their relationship, just to comment on that, because I know that uh, Flager in her book, she talks about how she records that anecdote that apparently Tolkien said to Lewis, that when Tolkien read Poetic Diction, um, he had to stop everything he thought he was going to say and rethink them. That was the sort of profundity of uh, the impact that Barfield had on him. But I think also actually that, you know, amongst anything else, the genius of Tolkien was he actually did what Barfield wrote about. Um, and he, for example, learned to trust language um, as, you know, a key channel for, as you say, this deepening interiority and uh, that immersion. That was in a way partly what operationalized it, I think, for him. Um, and realizing that language um, carries the insides of the whole world to us. Um, and that um, Barfield says this about people like Plato and Aristotle, actually, that you know, they coined lots of words that we still use now. Um, but to coin a word that really lasts is to struggle with consciousness. It is as much as creative as much as any other creative act. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I think that, you know, it may, maybe it is worth just, just, just raising the Christian elements. They were both, I think, in their different ways, uh, um, not just receivers of the Christian tradition, but were definitely reformers of it as well. Um, they particularly, I think, because they were alert to the interiority, to the what would be called the mystical side, they knew that, um, well, as Meister Eichhardt put it, I rather like the way he put it once when he said, the most important incarnation is the one, not the one that happened, well now, say 2000 years ago, um, but is the one that's happening now in the present moment in you and I. Um, it's because we tell the story of Jesus that we know it might be happening inside us here and now. Um, so I think that they were both advocating a recovery of the interior traditions in Christianity, realizing that the most powerful thing, um, you know, in the fallen world, as it were, is the human psyche. And unless that you um, work on that, um, everything else is going to um, suffer. Um, so that, that, that's part of their framing as well, I suppose, which they share. Hmm. Yeah, I, speaking of uh, inventing a word, right, you mentioned eucatastrophe. Um, I wonder if Becca would want to go into that a little bit because you talk about it so wonderfully in your book uh, about the, uh, uh, you, you mentioned that it's the mark of a good fairy story or, or Tolkien mentions that, uh, mm -hmm. you're quoting him. So I, I feel like that is so relevant for right now um, in the sense of, you know, the way out is through, right? So um there's just something about that word. I wrote this down in my, in my little notebook for the podcast, you catastrophe, climate crisis, COVID question mark, you know, so there's something here. Maybe we can explore. Well, the definition of you catastrophe that Tolkien created, it's basically that moment in a story when everything is going terribly wrong. It's, that basically all hope is lost. In The Lord of the Rings, spoiler alert, uh, it's that moment when Frodo's will is completely surrendered. And he says, I do not choose now to come. I, I do not choose to do what I have come to do. And he has come to the heart of Mount Doom to cast away the ring. And we know from chapter two of the book that he's incapable of throwing the ring then into his little home fire. So why should he be able to do, be able to do it now? And he has to surrender completely. He has to claim the ring for his own and give up the very last thing that was Frodo, that was his individual self, which is his capacity for goodness. He surrenders that too on the altar of of the quest of the world. And it is through that act of complete and utter surrender. And I feel it's relevant to compare that to 
Christ's moment on the cross and saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because it is, it's not just an utterly human moment for Frodo. It's even below that, the level of surrender, but it is that surrender that allows the you catastrophe to take place out of darkness, out of hopelessness, the unexpected can happen. And now Frodo doesn't have the moral superiority, the spiritual superiority over Gollum to be able to fight him off as he could do five minutes before. And Gollum is able to overtake him, bite the ring off of his hand and through chance. And whenever Tolkien uses the word chance, you know that he's pointing towards something, something that isn't chance. He's pointing toward divinity and that chance intervenes and Gollum steps off the, the edge of the cliff and, and falls to his own doom. I mean, that's the utter sacrifice is Gollum's and his own death and descent. And that, that is the way in which the ring is able to be unmade. And, and evil in that moment is destroyed for that moment, um, not for all of time, as that quote that, that you shared was. I, I believe it's actually Gandalf who says that in the um, in the last debate, speaking with Aragorn and, and the other captains of the West. And, um, but it's just for that moment that evil in, in this particular incarnation and form of it is destroyed. And T Tolkien compares, he says, the ultimate you catastrophe is the, uh, what takes place in the Gospels. And um, that it's the it's the death and the resurrection of Christ that is really the great eucatastrophe of, of our history. And that therefore makes the gospels the, um, the ultimate fairy story. And that shows you both how much fairy story meant to Tolkien, but also really this extraordinary subversion where truth and fairy story become blended in a beautiful way. I feel like this is the moment I have to hand this conversation over to Mark who can and will be able to speak on that so much more articulately, but uh, just that, that Tolkien identified the U catastrophe as that's the, the word he would use to describe the incarnation and also the resurrection that these are both new catastrophes of human history and of the story of, of Christ. Yeah, I mean, you put it very um, beautifully. And um, I mean, the, the thing, one of the great things about the word catastrophe is it really is a catastrophe. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, um, you know, just few, we got away with that. And I think that that is at the heart of Christianity, which is a real death, as you say, it is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But actually, I think it's at the heart of all the great wisdom traditions, too, that mm -hmm. death is not something to be got around, um, to go under or over. It is to be gone through. Um, sometimes when I align myself with, you know, uh, the evolution of consciousness and try and write about it, I have to remind myself that that is part of the commitment, actually, um, is to, to trust that. Um, and but in a way how could it be otherwise because we are talking about the birth of new perceptions we're not just talking about the extension of what we know already and that has got to um, involve what would feel like a catastrophe um, because it is a death in the literal sense but you know as Elliot also put it and the time for death is every moment in a way that's what you're committing yourself to as well um, yeah so it's although I think Tolkien and Barfield both use the Christian fairy tale um, to tell it. Um, it was, well, as Blake would say, you know, Christianity is true, not because it's particular and exclusive and, and the right way, it's because it is universal, because it, um, it, it highlights from its point of view what's true everywhere, um, and you can then see in other traditions as well. And the heart of it is, um, as Tolkien calls it, the catastrophe. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there are a lot of um, notes and elements I've been just thinking of, of interjecting with here with um, with the honorary inkling Gepser because just 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 uh, a quick purview of it would be, you know, interestingly enough, Gepser himself uh, spent a lot of time and attention on language and how language could describe just the very words themselves contained latently these other modes of consciousness, right? Um, I mentioned earlier myth and how it means the opening and closing of the wound or the mouth. And it expresses this kind of ambiguity of uh, polarities or complementary polarities. And he kind of goes into how language itself kind of moves into this more mental orientation where polarities are no longer kind of complementary or stable and, and um, instead must be resolved in the, in the process of thinking and the dialectic. Um, but on, on the other hand, another element here, which is just resoundingly coming to my um, attention to share, is this idea that, and he says this in um, the second part of Ever Present Origin, that you know um, much of what is going on is a dissolution, but the dissolution contains a solution. That is the only way you, you can see it, right? In the catastrophe is this salvific grace, um, to use more Christian language. Um, so one always has to have a kind of an orientation towards breakdown with what he calls a primal trust or primordial trust. And this is, it's a very, Gebser d didn't really use Christian language, but he always orbited around it and he would invoke and bring in Christianity where um, uh, it was kind of appropriate for it. But he says it's, it's a primordial trust in the spiritual, right? In this transformation, which has become, it's, it's not ours alone, right? We've been given this gift of bearing consciousness and bearing this unfolding. And we always, whether or not we realize it, we are participating in this gift and it is participating in us. And so there's this kind of um, uh, withness, I've been using this language recently, with the spiritual, right? The spiritual is with us and with the unfolding of humanity and history. And in these moments where so much is breaking down and so much as possible, uh, the, the restoring or sustaining element, you know, I'm not saying it's a cure, but, but that the orientation that we can take as a spiritual one or, or must take in these moments of just being vulnerable, knowing like, okay, I can't do it. I don't know what's going to come of this. I don't know if I will be on the other end of this, but I have to take that step and that leap and to trust in the spiritual, the divine or providence or grace um, that whatever is going to occur will occur according to that grace and according to that intelligence, according to the originary presence, right? Um, and so I think that's a, it's a, it's a similar, it's in the, in the, in the spirit of what I think uh, both Tolkien and, and Barfield and maybe Lewis um, had an orientation towards. But, um, and, and it would be great to kind of follow up in the near future too, because um, again, there are so many interesting notes in Gepser's writing about Christianity, particularly. Um, he, he talks, for instance, about um, the dogma of Mary in the Catholic Church being in instituted in the 50s, and how he saw this as a kind of um, subtle shift, a kind of a, an evolution of Christianity itself to deeply affirm not only the feminine, the assumption of Mary, but also a new kind of life, a new kind of matter in the Sri Aurobindian sense of the life divine, right? A, um, an event that has occurred in history that transfigures life itself, right? It's not just the physical birth or the physical death, but the new spiritual life of resurrection is the most, not only resurrection, but the assumption of Mary and the divine feminine, right? Um, so there's just so much, so many interesting things I think we could explore here in the topic of the evolution of consciousness in Christianity. Um, That's yeah, um, great. One, just one of my favorite Gebsu expressions actually talks about the need, I think it's for Christianity to intensify. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like that, that the, the, the energy of that expression that he gets. Mm. Becca, I interrupted. Mm. Oh, well, first of all, just I feel like the Assumption of Mary, which was an event that uh, C.G. Jung, for example, really celebrated. And perhaps that's another example of that intersection of history and myth where they come together. And I'm sure we could identify many of those moments of the intersection of history and myth. One thing that I so appreciated about 
each of your books. And for those listening who haven't read them, this is my plug for both of your books because what I felt in reading each one, first of all, how relevant it was to read them now. And it, part of the reason for that was I felt situated in this current moment in a lineage and a lineage that extends back as far as our memory can go. And Mark, what I felt in reading your work is that there is such an extraordinary recovery that you do in demonstrating that evolution of consciousness through the, the stages of both the Old and New Testament being written that just completely overturns the literalist perspective that is so often brought to bear on the Bible, both in terms of a fundamentalist reading of it and also as a means to dismiss it, to throw it out as something that is no longer relevant. And what you're doing there holds together, it, it allows us to drop back into that state of consciousness and see why the, the Bible says what it does. And it overturns that literalism and makes relevant for our current moment in a way that doesn't feel like we're just adhering to an old religion that has been around, you know, past its expiration date. There's something in what you've brought forward that, you know, as, as you say in your final chapter, we must be mystics. It reopens the living spirituality that has been encased within that tradition. And Jeremy as well, your book also does a similar, it makes a similar move of situating us and giving a sense for the fact that we're not just at some pitiful end of things, but that this is a living moment of transition that makes sense of the chaos and the, the feeling of loss and destruction and finding hope in the fact that this has been at as one of you brought up earlier, this has happened before. We have lived through moments like this. So in each of your works, I felt this tremendous sense of hope because what you're each articulating brings us into the reality of this current moment rather than longing for or pining for a lost time and rather shows how, no, we are right to, to use that metaphor again, we're right in the middle of a story. And that to recognize that is such a profound spiritual reclamation that can take place. With, with the Inklings, um, you know, for me in particular, it's been with Tolkien, but it's the story that Tolkien said to the atheist C.S. Lewis, that it's the myth of the dying and be reborn God that has been told over and over, that that is what is at the heart of the Christian mystery, and that the incarnation is the repetition of that myth once more, but landing in history. And just as that story from Tolkien converted Lewis to Christianity, not the branch of Christianity that Tolkien was hoping he would join him in, in Catholicism, he, he went his own way. But it's through that kind of mythic story. And, and for me personally, it's in a telling such as the Lord of the Rings that I feel personally closer to an understanding of that, that Christian mystery than any other form of Christianity that I had inherited up until that point. And I feel that same livingness in Tolkien's telling of the Eucatastrophe as, Mark, I feel in what you bring forward in your book, where there's a recognition of, oh, this, this, is, still, this is still alive because it doesn't have anything really to do with the trappings of dogma 
it's simply about our interior relationship to to the divine yeah and 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 if i may thank you for that and if i may um you know say one of the things which i got very powerful from your book and so would hugely recommend it because of not just what you say in the content but it leaves you with the feeling that the imagination is absolutely to be trusted um you can live at this threshold of the imagination um and um it will uh, reveal all sorts of things to you um i mean both what you write about tolkien but also in relation to jung as well of course um and um, i feel that is that that's a that's a key um trust um and and faculty that we have to develop um that um when we can um not just countenance the fantastical side um but realize that it is speaking to us um of um the inside of the whole world um which is another way i think of putting this how myth, when myth and history coincide um we um well we become capable not just of the one fold two fold three fold but the four fold vision um and um so you know we start seeing um that uh when a big institution like the catholic church um celebrates the ascent, the assumption of our lady um in a way that just becomes a type um uh, that uh we can start uh, experiencing all day and every day i mean you know blake would say it starts right at the beginning of every day when you see the sunrise this is eternity's sunrise it's not just another revolution of the earth and being able to experience life for all those different levels um and do, and it's it's work as well i get this very much from you know from tolkien um and barfield i mean barfield said he had one big idea that he just kept revisiting uh, but there is this as you say you know extraordinary effort right across tolkien's life um uh you know a bit like learning to play jazz you actually spend most of the time practicing scales and learning about harmony and all that you know and this is not just uh, a dreamy romanticism um it really is a commitment and a vocation um to the imaginative way mm. Becca, that um that line you bring up sometimes from Tolkien about the jail cell right that mm. that fantasy is escapism but um, maybe you want to mention that here, actually, just the, what Tolkien said about that, because I feel like that's so relevant. He addressed this idea that, you know, fairy story often gets accused of escapism. And he talks about this in his essay on fairy stories. And he draws the distinction between the escape of the prisoner and the flight of the deserter. And he says, you know, who would blame someone who finds themselves in prison for wanting to escape and go home? Or if he can't, then for wanting to talk about something else besides jailers and cell walls, because the world outside of the prison still exists, even for the prisoner. And what we can extrapolate that Tolkien is saying there is that our as he puts it, our so-called real life, capital R, capital L, is that prison. And the recognition that beyond those cell walls is the real world still. I mean, this is echoing back to Plato's cave, that the prison is the cave of shadows. And what is the real world outside of that? That is the enchanted and sold spiritual, mythical, imaginal world that our particular phase of consciousness in its, uh, in the form that we currently find it, where it's disenchanted, it's rational, um, the word is escaping me right now that Gebser uses, deficient. Um, it's the deficient phase of the mental, and we feel that deficiency as the prison walls. And so who would blame the person that wants to escape? And, but I think that it's not just a going home in the sense of going back to something. It's a going home in a deeper sense that a going home is, yes, a return, but also a coming to something new. Because, of course, your home has changed if you have been away. Mm, well said. Um, that's something that has been... Uh, uh, I've been thinking about this in the context of both of your works, like um, Mark, with your book, like Becca was saying, you you, ju you just make the evolution of consciousness and Christianity as as a subject, 
just come to life. It's this living dynamic transformational process. The process is alive. You could just, it just, you experience it when you read those books, uh, read um, Tolkien and when you read Barfield and then Becca with your book, I think you really demonstrate this as well with Tolkien. Like he's step into it, right? Step into this process of encountering the imagination and so, and what so much of it can, can teach us. And, um, you know, I was thinking of with you catastrophe, I was linking it to another word coined by, uh, I think it was coined by Michelle Bowens, who's um, a peer to peer economist and, and scholar, and he's kind of a Gibsarian thinker in, in and of himself. But um, he calls the event that's going on right now a pedagogical catastrophe, um, a, a catastrophe that teaches us something. And I'm just sort of constellating these themes together of the you catastrophe, the teaching catastrophe, and then also, you know, engaging with the imagination as a way in which not only we can get a sense of what is happening in the present and the, the living past, but also the latent future, right? And there's so much of that in Tolkien's work as well, not just a sense of the, the narrowing down of the world or becoming into the age of falling into the age of men, the loss of enchantment, but there's also this kind of mystery in that fall, which is a kind of eucatastrophe in itself that uh, we talked about this in your, in your class on um, the Silmarillion that Iluvatar says, you know, even this event with Morgoth, right. You know, sort of, um, messing up the song of creation like even that could be in the mystery of Iluvatar's creativity divine creativity could be turned into something else that is unknowable um and i just i think that's a beautiful way of thinking about just the long march of, of human history right and and the moment that we are in um and again it's not a blind optimism but i, I do think that that kind of sublime trust in not only the imagination and the faculty of it, but in this process of our becoming, you know, I think both of your works just so wonderfully presentiate that to use a Gepsarian term as well. It, it presentiates that and renders it present for us. And I think we, we need the, those, those little transformations of our own perception in this time. I think that gives us this sense that, um, you know, we are participating in this creative process and it is participating in us. So thank you both. Um, this has been a, we've gone like almost two hours. This has been a great <laughs> conversation. It has flown by. So I think we're going to have to do a, a redux and come back together sometime in the near future. Well, thank, well, thank you, you very much both. It's a joy to speak, share these things. Mm -hmm. Likewise. Likewise. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Such a pleasure to, to get to speak with both of you. And um, I, I do hope that whether in this kind of format or, you know, someday again, when we can actually meet at, at a pub somewhere, I know we're, we're spread out across the world, but um, maybe we can have that intimacy someday. I'd love to just call that in to continue to have this kind of conversation. And I would love to do another um, recorded one as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, a Zoom Inklings pub uh, we'll have to do for now. But yeah, yeah, let's let's bookmark that. That's that's already ap happening sometime in the future. It's latent. Um, so thank you both. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Becca. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>